Hey, real quick. If you're new here and wandered into part two without watching the previous video, I highly recommend that you go back to my channel and watch the first part so that you can get the whole story on the development of Guilty Gear. It's fine, go ahead, click on the card in the top right corner, but if you have watched part one, then let's just dive in. As discussed from the previous video, Guilty Gear X saw great success with a growing fan base, raking in 284 million yen in arcades and a quarter of a million units pushed for home console. Searching for another win, Sammy Corporation pulled the trigger on yet another Guilty Gear game. In January 2002, the newly minted Sammy Studios announced that Guilty Gear X2 The Midnight Carnival would be released for the Sega Naomi that spring. A PlayStation 2 version would be released later that year. Not unlike Guilty Gear X, X2 saw a number of new battle mechanics and quality of life revisions from the sequel. Five new characters were added to the roster, bringing the body count to 23. The dust button was added to the control scheme, officially making Guilty Gear X2 a five-button fighting game. Dust takes over the functionality of pressing slash and heavy slash for accessing universal overhead launchers and sweep attacks, plus adding new aerial moves and specials as well. Players can now execute air throws, and the faultless defense cancel gets thrown in the trash where it fucking belongs. False roaming cancels are introduced, where at the cost of 25% meter, character-specific projectiles and moves can be canceled before their hitbox becomes active. A new psych burst mechanic offers a defensive feature that forces the opponent off of you while under pressure. The burst gauge fills as you take and deal damage, and has two different forms depending on when it's used. The blue burst is the standard psych burst that activates while in block or hit stun. However, should you use a psych burst while an enemy is in a neutral state, it will flash gold and you will earn yourself a full bar of tension. A new single player mode called Medal of Millionaires offers a very similar experience to survival mode. Players have a metal gauge that fills up when you land solid consecutive hits. As you continue to perform well, the value of those medals increase, earning you more points. However, your meter will decrease faster depending on how much those medals are worth and should you deplete the gauge completely during a high-value metal, you'll receive a fever penalty, forcing you to start over. Alternative character profiles like GG, GGX, and EX can be unlocked through survival mode, which modifies the respective command list based on the version that you choose, much like in the previous entry. Shadow characters are introduced as a busted middle ground option between EX and gold character versions, and other features seen in Guilty Gear X like Mission Mode, Story Mode, and Versus Mode also makes a return. Guilty Gear X2 was an overwhelming success, with an easy 112,000 copies sold for the PlayStation 2 version alone. It received top marks from numerous gaming publications and panels, such as G4 TV, Gaming Age, and much, much more. IGN's Jeremy Dunham critiqued that while the game may be too advanced for more casual fighting game fans, its only real fault was that there wasn't a Capcom logo on the box, causing fans to overlook this marvelous game. GameSpot declared Guilty Gear X2 as the best PlayStation 2 game of January 2003. GameSpy ranked it fifth on their year-end list as easily one of the best fighting games to come out in the last couple of years. IGN placed it in its top 10 hidden gems in 2004, and the escapist's John Funk called it the greatest fighting game of the last generation. That's not even all of its accolades, as publication after publication placed X2 amongst the greatest that the fighting game genre had to offer. Guilty Gear X2 also marked the first time where Daisuke Ishiwatari was not front and center of a mainline game's development. Whether it was due to increased responsibilities within the company or for personal reasons, he took a back seat and was more involved with the storyline writing and composition, allowing other rising stars to take charge, most notably Minoru Kiruka and Toshimichi Mori. Now here is where we begin to see an unhealthy trend spark out of Sammy's studio, as they look to capitalize on this newfound success with the Guilty Gear franchise. Granted, some of the decisions they made were very necessary, like the five revisions seen to the X2 platform. Reload was released for the Sega Naomi and PlayStation 2 less than a year later, with character rebalances, different missions, and a very minor modification to the HUD. It's more or less the same game as X2. Reload also received an alternative soundtrack in Korea by Next, a progressive metal band based in Seoul. The album is quite hard to find, so I encourage you to go seek it out. It absolutely slams. Slash feels like a wildly different game, both in gameplay and in aesthetic. Released only in Japan for the Sega Naomi and PlayStation 2, it offers more impactful frame data changes, modified animations for character inputs, or completely new inputs altogether. Execution is much stricter in Slash than in previous entries, with the input commands for certain characters having to be near lightning fast. 
Here I'm trying to pop a wild throw at the same speeds of other games, and it just comes out as Bandit Bringer or Bandit Revolver. The HUD also gets a complete overhaul, which is honestly more appealing to my own tastes, with the burst gauge only a few steps away from being one of those unreadable slam metal band logos. Slash also marks the first appearance of ABBA from Guilty Gear Isaka and Order Soul, and let me just tell you how... Ugh. Do you see this charge meter? How am I supposed to work with this? This is why Slash never came to the States. This right here. Accent Court introduces pseudo-EX moves called Force Breaks that burn 25% meter. They're essentially beefed up specials, and some open up new complex combo routes that bring so much more depth to the game. New hit effects are added in the form of wall splats and ground slides. Slashbacks are a form of parry that reduces block stun and nullifies damage, similar to the parry system of Third Strike, along with correcting Order Souls charge meter and eviscerating Souls King. Cliff and Justice are removed for not being tournament legal, and the story mode gets dropped for some unexplained reason. Accent Core also marks the first time Guilty Gear sees censorship, as blood is removed from gameplay, with the exception of Testament and Ava. Something about preserving the goth kid's image? I don't know. Accent Core Plus is a light revision from the previous installment, where we see a return of a few modes that went missing, like Mission Mode and Story Mode. AC Plus brings Cliff and Justice back with rebalances to make them seem fair. Survival Mode gets a new feature where at the end of a Daredevil match, you can give yourself a temporary or permanent bonus like an extra air dash, full meter on the next battle, or buffing your attack and defense. Once these changes were made in Survival, it kinda made Metal of Millionaires obsolete for me. We also see Team Versus Mode make a return as well as net play for the PS3 and 360 platforms. Finally, we have Accent Core Plus R, the last of the X2 series. Plus R retains much of what was in the previous entries while adding new features that were ahead of its time. My favorite addition is Replay Mode, where you can go into past online matches and not only review your tapes, but take control of a player mid-match to lab out potential answers where you got punished. For example, here we have me playing Kai against a Faust player, and had I answered with Air Dash Kick quicker, it would have punished Faust's forward heavy, giving me the counter hit. I don't know how many games have this feature, but it is an asset that honestly should be in every single fighting game. Plus R also rebalances the cast once more, fixing a lot of the issues that we had with certain characters. That means new force breaks, overdrives, and command normals are also available. The combo counter now highlights invalid combos to show when you or the opponent could have teched out of hit stun, and GGPO is added to the Steam version of the game, making it the definitive version to play. I'm not going to beat a dead horse here. Mm, that much. X2 was, and still is, in my top 5 fighting games of all time, even topping the list for nearly 15 years. There's still some balancing issues, perhaps some characters have more tools than others, but that's where matchup knowledge comes in. Say what you will about Plus Art by today's standards, X2 was made for the sweaty tryhard. Even to this day, Plus R sees regular play on Steam, and many Discord communities exist that are still running events and tournaments. Now then, recalling back to when I commented on Sammy's desire to milk the series for what it was worth. In and around the early 2000s, games coarsely labeled as party fighters like Super Smash Bros. Melee and other arena fighters were making waves in the casual market, and Sammy wanted in on that. At the 2003 Gemma Arcade Show, Sammy announced that Guilty Gear Isaka for the Atomus Wave about four months after the release of Guilty Gear X2 Reload. It was marketed as this innovative fighter hybrid that would support up to four on-screen players and appeal to both hardcore and mainstream fans. The build felt like it was Reload, but to supplement the two additional characters on screen, Arc System Works created a second background fighting plane. To compensate for the multiple fighters, Isaka implemented the turn button. You see, in Melee and other platform fighters of its time, fighters don't have complex special inputs, and your character will always move forward whether you're pressing right or left on the control stick. In traditional fighting games, the fighter is programmed so that you will always face your enemy, so if your opponent is on the right side of the screen, pressing left will make you walk backwards. That's where the turn button comes in, as it forces your character to reorientate themselves in order to respond to flanking enemies, but more importantly, preserve the character's moveset. It should work in theory, but the environment Isaka creates is nothing short of pure chaos. Being that you're not used to manually controlling when you should turn, gameplay tends to be a lot of flailing around when you're first jumping in. Once you get the hang of things, it's still a mess to play. Arcade mode will pit you against a single enemy at first, but its survival style leveling system is active, meaning that every 10 levels, you'll get slapped with a daredevil match when you face off against two enemies that are paired up. That's right, it's a 2 on 1 brawl and you don't got no friends. 
Now you're stuck swinging wide and trying not to get sandwiched in because once you get surrounded, you're going to live there for a minute. Now, there's also additional inputs specific to Isika that's supposed to expand the multiplayer elements like lane jumping, back attacks, so on and so forth. I guess they could help, but until you break past the first proverbial wall of turning, you're going to be stuck trying to do fancy things after it's already too late. Isika was, and still is, that weird game in the franchise, and every series has at least one. Surprisingly, it was nominated as the best sequel fighting game for the 2004 National Academy of Video Game Testers and Reviewers, something I didn't know f***ing existed until writing this piece. However, being in the same bracket as Def Jam Fight for New York and Dead or Alive Ultimate didn't give it a chance. Trying to stick with the positives here, the only thing I really jive with is the music. The soundtrack is incredibly underrated, a bit of a departure from the straightforward hard rock heavy metal tunes of its predecessors. Isika's OST features a bit more symphonic elements to its tracks, even more industrial and new metal influences to be. Outside of that, it falls short from grace in the eyes of both fans and critics alike, and is best summed up by GameSpy's Sounds Good on Paper award. Isika was wildly stripped down compared to its contemporaries, and the actual gameplay devolved into a cat and mouse game once there was only two players left in a match. But Guilty Gear Isika was in fact not the series' lowest point, as Sammy Studios handed the reins over to Studio Exaflex, a small development team outside of Shinjuku, Tokyo. Up until this point, their only experience in video game design was in supporting the Summon Knight series, and historically provided developer support to larger studios, the likes of which Arc System Works took advantage of. With the support of Exaflex, Arc System Works went on to push out Guilty Gear Dust Strikers for the Nintendo DS. In an attempt to further appeal to its casual market, Dust Strikers is a four-player platform fighter of the most basic form. Obviously not learning from its previous mistakes, Dust Strikers tried making a bootleg version of Jump Ultimate Stars, and it completely botches the landing. It's barren, the controls are clunky, half the items are completely worthless, and the AI acts like it's on life support. Someone thought it was a great idea to add minigames to Dust Strikers, like helping jam balancing falling lunchboxes or May's dolphin ring challenge thing. Dust Strikers is admittedly modeled after Isika, probably because Koki Sadamori wanted to make sure that the series stayed dead after this. Arc System Works made one more attempt at the handheld market with Guilty Gear Judgment. The one thing that we didn't touch on was Isika's GG Boost Mode, which is a side-scrolling beat-em-up in the same vein as Tekken Force. Judgment takes what GG Boost was and expands on it, giving it a full-blown story. Characters are unlocked between cutscenes, and there's no more than short conversations that slowly piecemeal plot to the player. The control scheme is completely revamped to fit the beat-em-up playstyle, now using light, medium, and heavy attacks along with the jump button. The back attack is borrowed from Isika, and psych bursts can now be used to recover health along with their normal functions from the original game. Command lists for the characters are trimmed down to fit the playstyle of Judgment, a move made for the better as Judgment feels like a decent beat-em-up. In fact, Judgment is my favorite beat-em-up, as it's one of the few, if not the only game in its genre that offers input commands with its gameplay, but that's just the ADHD in me talking. Plus, when you become bored with Judgment, you can just boot up Guilty Gear X2 Reload to get some actual matches in. Now, before we move forward with the mainline series, there are two more footnotes to be aware of the mobile games, and the rumored collaboration with Capcom. Arc System Works had ported over the original Guilty Gear with Guilty Gear Club for the FOMA 900, 901, and 902 devices. A sequel was made that same year with Guilty Gear Raid of Arms, which was nothing more than a glorified expansion of Club. It had simplified controls to accommodate for flip phone number keys, and had platform-specific enemies that are never seen or referenced again. The more obscure footnote of the Guilty Gear franchise once again begins at JAMA 2003, the very same trade show that Guilty Gear Isika was announced. Sammy briefly revealed that they were working on a collaboration with Capcom, alluding to a potential Capcom vs. Sammy branding. While most would assume that there would have been some crossover with the Street Fighter franchise, it was actually more likely that we would have seen a Guilty Gear vs. Darkstalkers game, as Capcom's Noritaka Funamizu was somehow connected to the project. It was also believed that Capcom's Team Dirty Beret was involved on the programming side of the new Guilty Gear game, but there's been no hard evidence of this being true. Years later, it was revealed that due to the project being dormant for so long, and the corporate climate between Arc System Works and Sammy changing drastically, 
Any hopes of Guilty Gear crossovers with Capcom was ultimately put to rest. Sammy's meteoric rise in the video game space during the early 2000s brought on new troubles for Arc System Works. After the fall of the Dreamcast, Sammy took the next step in their relationship with Sega and proceeded with a merger to both companies' benefit. Sega had been operating in the red for almost a decade, and Sammy was looking to further expand beyond Pachi slots. The road to the merger was rocky, but Sega Sammy Holdings Incorporated was ultimately founded on October 1, 2004. Some of the direct effects from the merger involved Sammy Studios breaking away from the partnership and rebranding itself as High Moon Studios, who has since assisted in the development of high-profile games such as the Destiny and Call of Duty franchises. Sammy Europe and Sega of Korea soon follow suit in 2008. As for Arc System Works, there seems to have been a falling out between themselves and Sammy, as ASW began self-publishing or leaning on Axis Games for assistance in publishing Guilty Gear X2 Accent Core for the Naomi GD-ROM and PlayStation 2 respectively. In regards to creating new Guilty Gear media, Daisuke and team went for the option select with Guilty Gear 2 Overture. Released for the Xbox 360 and much later Windows, Overture at the time was described as an action-based game with real-time strategy elements. Looking back at it now, and you can argue that it was one of the first multiplayer online battle arenas, predating League of Legends by almost two years. Much like a MOBA, you take the reins of one of seven champion, um, no, masters, while your AI-controlled servants and minions roam the battlefield. The goal of each battle is simple, destroy the opponent's main base, which is called a Master Ghost. The Master Ghost is multifunctional. Being near it can replenish your HP and tension, and it is the location where your minions and servants will spawn from. Minions have a single purpose, to gain control of command posts called ghosts. They can attack enemies as they approach, but their main purpose is to capture the ghosts. These command posts heal nearby allies and net the player mana, which is the currency for each battle. Meanwhile, servants are combat units, mainly comprising of melee, tank, and ranged units, although there are other servant types. These units can be used to defend your ghosts, assist minions in capturing other ghosts, or attack the enemy master ghost by ordering them via the organ. The organ is a command menu where you can use your mana that you gain from ghosts and combat to build servant units, purchase items and character-specific upgrades, and command your units to attack or defend different outposts. Whether at the time of creation or on the fly, servants can be paired into groups and attack as one massive unit. Servant combat revolves around a rock-paper-scissor triangle system, where melee units beat out ranged units, who beat out tank units, who kill melee units. The strategy revolves around managing your resources and directing where to send your units, as you wouldn't want them fighting against servants that they're weak against. As for controlling your master, it operates very much like any third-person action game. In free mode, melee begins by pressing the X button, and you can perform a number of combo routes by pressing either X or Y. Outside of combo strings, pressing the Y button in free mode activates the master's neutral special, like Soul's Gunflame or Kai's Stun Edge. When targeting an opponent, you gain access to command normals like slides and uppercuts, along with specials like Volcanic Viper, Bandit Revolver, and Breakdown. Unlike the fighting games, special attacks require tension, which you'll build over time by attacking or hanging around a master ghost. Psychome Blasts operate much like Psych Bursts, and modern cancels are used like roaming cancels to suspend attack animations and quickly transition into another combo string. It's obvious that Guilty Gear 2 Overture is a strong departure from the mainline series. Ishiwatari and company felt that Arc System Works pushed the Guilty Gear franchise to its absolute limits with Accent Core, and looked to explore new ground within the IP. Wanting to stay in the space of competitive games, Daisuke looked towards the European and American markets to research what type of game could be successful without giving up the core spirit of Guilty Gear's roots. Overture also bookmarks a significant shift within Daisuke's legal ability to continue the works of Guilty Gear's storyline, as the IP no longer completely belonged to Arc System Works. You see, when Sammy Corp commissioned and published Guilty Gear X, they retained the rights to any characters and settings created during the development of X and X2. Being dropped from Sega Sammy meant that they weren't allowed to use characters like Johnny or Eno or even Faust, as Sega technically owned those characters. So in order to continue the story of Guilty Gear, a completely new cast of characters were drawn up like Sin and Dr. Paradigm, the Kingdom of Illyria was established, and Dizzy was simply referred to as the Maiden of the Grove. Guilty Gear 2 Overture received a lukewarm response from critics and fans alike. 
sitting at a 56 on Metacritic and a 6.0 for user scores. IGN's Levi Buchanan criticized the game's unintuitive use of the organ system to manage your units mid-combat, and preferred if Overture focused on either being a beat-em-up or a strategy game, but not both. Destructoid's Brian Rice called the strategy components too simplistic, and that the dialogue in the campaign is barely comparable to a B-movie. When I first got my hands on the game, I made it to the fight with Raven, and I gave up never touching the game again for a good solid 10 years. But after revisiting it, I can say that Overture is interesting at the very least. It lacks the depth or polish to really be considered a true hidden gem. But for lore monsters out there, Overture is f***ing dense with information. You just have to decipher whatever the hell the characters are talking about half the time. Hmm. It's an application of the space curve. The Magic's five context is the basis, and there is a link to the nth mapping. Do you understand it? Yeah, I get it. A variant of the Ouroboros loop. This chord habit, I definitely recognize it. What are you talking about? No, 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 seriously. The campaign is an absolute nightmare to get through. And it's not even just the poor translation. The AI is awful. There's this mission where you get paired up with Paradigm to take out the big bad. Now usually, if the master I was controlling were to die, I would respawn a good 30 seconds back at my master ghost, and the overall health of my master ghost would go down by roughly 33%, just as a penalty. However, your allied masters do not respawn at their master ghost when they die. They just die. And when you die, you lose the battle as keeping them alive is a requirement. There was not a single moment in this chapter where Paradigm didn't cry for help and sending my units didn't do anything because you cannot assign your units to other masters, only to specific ghosts, which means if I sent my servants over to help out my allies and they got to their destination, all they would do was watch Paradigm die repeatedly as he got his cheeks clapped. This means that I have to play daddy daycare with my incompetent bird dragon ally or I have to bum rush me and my servants to the enemy's master ghost. You take a guess what worked out. Oh no, I can't keep them off. Nah, f you bitch. Hey, help! Even a battle-hardened soldier can't match perfectly crafted strategy. You didn't do anything! Now then, before we close out this chapter for the Overture arc, there are two additional spin-offs that need to be acknowledged. Axis developed and published the North American exclusive Pro Jumper Guilty Gear Tangent for the Nintendo DSi in June 2011. The connection to the Guilty Gear franchise is extremely limited, as you actually play as Chimaki, the mascot of Overture. Tangent is a somewhat fast-paced platformer where you navigate the perils of a local bathhouse and end up fighting against a Chimaki version of Soul Bad Guy. It's not that bad, but you're better off watching a Let's Play. The second game is the Japan-exclusive Guilty Gear Vastage XT for the iPhone platform. It's a simple pochi slot-based visual novel that serves as a lore dump for the events between Overture and the next mainline entry. After Overture, the Guilty Gear series saw a lengthy hiatus from the public eye. Between poor reception of Guilty Gear 2 and the legal tightrope Arc System Works would have had to walk in working with Sega Sammy, many thought that they saw the last of the series. During that time, Arc System Works shifted focus on Toshimichi Mori's new project Blaze Blue, which was speculated to be Guilty Gear's successor. Daisuke Ishiwatari would go on to join Team Blue and assist Mori as the lead composer for Blaze Blue's soundtrack, and then once again lend his voice to Imiko Iwasaki's Battle Fantasia series. However, in May of 2011, Arc System Works quietly filed a trademark for Guilty Gear, meaning that there was some sort of breakthrough deal reached between Sega Sammy and ASW. With no more obstacles in their way, Arc System Works' newly minted Team Red moved forward to create the next generation of Guilty Gear games. Hey guys, I know that I promised that part 2 would be the end of the Guilty Gear retrospective, but I did not account for the sheer amount of information concerning both X2 and Overture. Part 3 is definitely going to be the last one, and it will be due out sometime in April, which works out because Strive's delay to June and all. So, as always, thank you for sticking around with me for this ride, and I eagerly await your feedback for part 2 and whatever comes in the future. Do the thing that every YouTuber asks for, like, comment, subscribe, all that bullshit. And until next time, 
Take care.